Making 3D characters is easy. You just give the software a drawing, add a ball of clay, then match it to the reference, give it some paint, add some light, and render. Hmm. Unfortunately, it's not actually this easy, but you already knew that because this video isn't 10 seconds long. Now, if you wanna see how that character was actually made, then watch till the end credits and I'll link you right to it because in this video, we're gonna turn this awesome sketch by Cameron Mark into 3D. We'll look at sculpting, painting, rendering, and more. So whether you aspire to work for Pixar or you just wanna see how this was made, stick around because I'm sure there's something in this video for you. If you don't know who Cameron Merck is yet, then I'd strongly suggest visiting his Instagram wall because as you can see, he's an incredible character designer and painter. And I'd like to thank him again for letting me reference his work. Shall we begin? With my main reference off to the side, I start with a ball of clay. Now, if you see my other videos, you'll know that I approach the head by finding a series of shapes. The first of which represents the skull in its most simplified form, which is this egg shape with a wedge attached. When I'm happy with it, I pull out a neck, which notice travels slightly backwards rather than going straight down. I add a new sphere to begin working the upper torso, and this shape represents the rib cage and collarbones. I'm keeping things nice and simple for now because the more detail we add, the more difficult it becomes to make big changes. With this in mind, I check the proportions against the reference. Now you wanna be very careful when overlaying your references like this for several reasons. The most obvious in this case is that the drawing is paused. The head is turned and slightly tilted towards the camera, so when we try to match it, our body is facing in the wrong direction. Now it is possible to pause the 3D shapes to match the concept, but we wanna keep symmetry for as long as possible to avoid sculpting everything twice. I duplicate the upper torso and rotate it to begin the lower. You might be wondering what the point of this is since the lower torso isn't in the concept nor the final 3D model. Well, the reason is because when we sculpt, we're always comparing shapes and proportions and negative space with other objects on the canvas. And by adding in the lower torso, I'll be able to better judge things like the length of the arms and where the elbow should go. I bring in a basic ear using something called an insert mesh brush. And if you'd like to know how to make your own, I've made a tutorial which I'll link below. Now I'm being particularly meticulous in this block out because these shapes will be available in my next base mesh pack, but more on that later. I also think it's worth noticing how satisfying it is to say particularly meticulous. Go on, give it a try. It's good, isn't it? With the ears looking suitably cartoony, I start marking out space for a chin. I also make marks for the cheekbones and the temporal region of the skull. These will help me find some plane changes later. Next I add a cube and start on the shoulders. The shape I'm looking for here is a simplified shoulder muscle known as the deltoid. The arms are made using something called z-spheres. Now it's always helpful to add a bend at the elbow to judge the proportions better. It also gives the arm a more natural look. For the bobs, I add in a couple of spheres and make them appear more natural by pulling them into a teardrop shape. Next, I start adding muscles to the arms. And I don't really need to since they're mostly covered up anyway, but it's good to get in the practice to avoid getting rusty. Speaking of which, it's been a while since I made a hand from scratch, so here we go. I start with a cube for the palm section of the hand and squash it to size. Now if you look in between your fingers you'll notice that the bottom section is further forward than the top and it's also got a curve to it. And the thumb comes off the hand at quite an angle which can be quite tricky but don't forget you have real life reference right in front of you. Notice there's a slight taper from the knuckles to the base of the hand. Next I add in a cube for the first finger. Now the fingers don't all look exactly the same, but they're similar enough to duplicate this once we've detailed it a bit to save time. The length of the middle finger is roughly the length of our palm section and I start by marking out the knuckles on top and the creases underneath. Similar to the arm, the fingers tend to look a bit more natural with a slight bend. In fact, I should have sculpted this hand in pause really, given how complicated it is to avoid having to rig it. So I'm gonna confess early and tell you that I do end up replacing this hand with one that I rigged earlier. Now, I don't feel like I've wasted time here though because practice is practice and it made me realize how rusty I'd become. So expect a lot more hands in future videos. 
For now, I think it's time to move on to the next phase of the sculpt. So I start carving out space for a face. Now, this drawing is all I have to work from, so I'm trying to imagine how she would look in three dimensions. A really nice thing you can do to help with this is to draw a wireframe of the drawing. Not only will this help you to understand the concept better, but it will also push you to think in 3D and it will even improve your 2D skills as well. I worked the head for a while, but before I start the eyelids, let's pop in some eyes. I paint some plain black irises to help me place the eyelids in a second. Now that mark I just made under the eye basically represents the placement of the eye socket and cheekbone. Now personally I find it much easier to sculpt the top eyelid without a crease at first and then I'll carefully add it in later. Now this has got to be the narrowest yet longest mouth I've ever attempted to sculpt so you might notice me struggling with it at first but I'm confident that it'll look alright by the end. You've got to have faith in the process. Adding in a basic cylinder to represent the teeth is always helpful when sculpting an open mouth. Now it's up to you whether you replace it with more realistic looking teeth later. Now I realise it's difficult to get your head around this series of 3D shapes at first so I've come up with something to help you. While I was creating this piece, each time I got to what I call a key shape, I put it to one side for later and let me tell you why they're going to help you level up regardless of whether you sculpt in ZBrush, Blender or any other sculpting app. The idea is to use these 3D models as reference as you sculpt, which is a lot more valuable than using 2D images when you're trying to understand 3D form. You can look at the reference from all sorts of different angles and even chop sections out to understand the cross section. But that's not even the best part. As you finish each level, you can compare your progress with the reference using morph targets or shape keys. Each reference image gets progressively more difficult, so if you feel like you've mastered level 1, you can start from level 2 or 3. In case you do prefer to use 2D image references, each model has been captured from an array of different angles for you to compare your work to as you sculpt. If you're interested in finding out more, check out the link below or above, uh, somewhere near this video, to get yourself set up and moving on to the next level. Jumping forward a little, I mask out some eyebrows and extract. It's good to get things like eyes, eyebrows and eyelashes in early because they're key elements to the facial expression. Even though I don't have the final paused expression in place, I can feel her sassiness starting to come through already. Come on then, let's start on this hair. All I'm doing at this stage is trying to ignore all the details and focusing on the hair mass. We can add details gradually as we go along. Try thinking of the character as walking towards you from a distance. At first you see the silhouette or overall shape of the character. As they get closer, you start to see large shapes within the silhouette. When the character walks right up to you, you can see a lot more details within these larger shapes. Keep watching the video and you'll see that this is exactly how I approach the hair. Now unfortunately I forgot to record this bit so I've recovered the footage from the live stream as you can see but don't worry it's not for long. To start the dress I just duplicated the body and deleted the parts that I didn't need. Now like the hair there's not really much to it for now but I'll come back to it later. Now I have a nice idea to create the necklace in Blender which I started by sending over the head. After duplicating an edge going around the neck and converting it to a curve, I can use a couple of array modifiers to create these spheres around the neck. Then I can apply the modifiers and send it back to ZBrush, where I duplicate one of these spheres to make the jewel at the front. I also add in a circle, which I extrude for thickness, to make the backplate for the jewel. Looking good, Marie. Remember those secondary hair shapes I mentioned? I start by inserting a sphere and moulding it roughly into the shape of the, to use the technical term, twirly bit at the front. To start these curls at the bottom, I insert a cylinder and again just start pushing things around and laying on clay to indicate the directionality of the hair. I'm not at all concerned about being neat because I know most if not all of this base hair will get covered later. I continue this idea at the top too, making marks to indicate directionality and form, but I'll start extracting shapes out shortly. I mask shapes on the hair that correspond with the marks that I've made and extract. It's a lot easier to move these strands around as separate objects rather than trying to sculpt them into a single mesh. 
It's also good to add planes to these shapes to give them definitive edges, otherwise they end up looking like sausages. I'm still not overly worried about the finer details though because these shapes will also get covered up by even smaller strands later. In fact, let's send all this stuff over to Blender so we can get to work on that. I'll quickly set up some lights and bring in the first hair strand. Before I start placing the strand, I'm first going to tweak this shape, which represents this cross section of the hair strand. I'll rearrange the workspace so you can see what's going on. Notice that as I change this shape up here, the hair strand down here changes with it. Now this is how I design the finer details of my hair strands. I'll go into more detail about this in my cartoon head sculpting course, which I'll release later this year. Once I've found something I'm happy with, I start laying it on the head, using the base hair as a guide. This does tend to take quite a while, but it doesn't require a lot of brain power, so it can be quite therapeutic. The goal here isn't to completely cover the base hair with these strands, because if I did that, there would be too much detail in the hair. Adding detail is good, but if you add it everywhere, you don't leave space for the eye to rest, so I'll let the simple base show through in places. To model the glass, I used a tool that I know a lot of you didn't know existed, but has been there since forever, called Sweet Profile 3D. Basically, you control the profile of your model using this graph on the right, which is really nice for objects with radial symmetry. I then use my normal sculpting brushes with radial symmetry turned on to tweak the result. After bringing it into Blender and roughly putting it into place, I'm now thinking I want to pause the hand. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I now have the problem of how am I going to get this hand into pause without going through the headache of rigging it. That's where Chloe comes in, one of my OCs that doesn't show her face nearly enough, so I'm going to try and fix that. But for now, well, let's just rip her arm off. Oh, Chloe. Even with a rigged hand, this was a really awkward pause to get the hand into, and I ended up working it quite a bit in ZBrush. I send the new hand back over to Blender and notice there's a ball missing from the back of the head. So I add a plane and start shaping it into one half of a ball. Then I extrude it to give it some thickness and add a mirror modifier to create the other side. After tweaking the shape a little, I add in a torus to represent the knot in the middle. That's good enough for me. Now, I think the hair is looking quite cool, but I also think it could be made better. One thing I want to do is break up this silhouette a bit by adding in some breakaway strands like this. I'm just duplicating the big strands and shrinking it right down, and I do this at various points across the hairstyle. Next up, it's time to replace those eyes with the eye designer add-on. If you haven't seen it before, it's basically a really easy way to get Pixar style eyes into your character and you get all these controls down the side to change the look of the eye. You can even bake out the result and use it in a different app such as Maya or a game engine. I would definitely recommend checking it out using the link below but then I'm biased because I made it. Now you might have noticed that I'm gradually shading things as I progress such as a few purple objects in the scene. Now, using this colour purple was intentional because, from a semiotics viewpoint, the colour purple is said to signify things like royalty and power. Now, this is because historically purple dye was very difficult and expensive to produce and for a long time only the wealthiest people could afford purple clothing. Though it's relatively inexpensive today, the colour purple is often used to signify this idea. Next up is possibly my favourite part of the entire process, which is painting the skin. Now for me, this is where the character starts to become alive, especially when you drop a bit of red on the cheeks and nose and start painting the lips. When you're painting skin like this though, you don't want to overdo anything. Just lightly add colours and then go over them with the skin tone to bring them back a little. If you google colour zones of the face, you'll find a bunch of images to help you choose some colours, but remember that stylized characters are usually simplified in a certain direction, so you don't necessarily need to go crazy with colours to get a nice result. When we bring it into Blender, things are starting to look really nice. Now to get her into the pose, I create a really basic rig for my character using just three bones. Now, if you've ever rigged a character before, you'll already know this, but it's very important that when the head is connected to a bone, that you mosh your character to whatever music is on at the time, like so. Then, and only then, can you start pausing. 
Now, I notice she's holding an empty glass, so to fix that, I duplicate the glass itself and deleted the stem. Then I closed off the bottom like this and the top like this, and then added some color so that we can see it through the glass. This wine looks a bit watered down, but we'll come back to that later. Next up are the ruffles on the outfit. Now I started this with the understanding that I was going to be pushing and pulling clay around for the next few hours to get this into shape, but someone on the live stream had the bright idea of doing this with an insert mesh like I did with the ear earlier. Now after a quick Google search, I found Alexandra Jackson had created said brush for just $5 on the art station, so I saved myself those hours and used that instead. It still took some tweaking to get the result I was after, but it gave me a good head start. After this, I started painting the hair. Like the skin, I start with an overall base colour and then start to add colours over that. When you're making roots darker like this, you want to make sure it's not just a darker version of the rest of the hair, otherwise it will look a bit muddy like mine does here. Now to fix this, I came in with a slightly redder colour like so. Now this girl really needs her roots doing now, but it's fine, you can just lighten things up afterwards. When I bring it into Blender, I realise for the first time in this entire process that this character is supposed to be wearing a bracelet. Now I didn't do anything fancy for this, I just start with a sphere and just kept duplicating it until we had a bracelet. With everything now in place, I start the final tweaking of the model. Now here I'm checking things like anatomy, pose, silhouette, is there any intersecting geometry, you know, that sort of thing. I can't say that I enjoy this all that much because each change makes such a small difference to the final piece and at this stage you just want to get onto rendering, but it all adds to the quality of the final image. Once I'm happy with it though, I move on to lighting the model and then of course rendering. Now before we see the final result, I just wanted to ask that if you enjoyed this video and you learned something new, please give it a thumbs up and share it on Facebook or Twitter or whatever you use, it would really help. And if you want to see more videos like this in future, please do subscribe and click the bell so you get notified. That's it from me, see you in the next one.